Uh, so first and foremost, can you hear me? Um, I wish to acknowledge the custodians of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past and present. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. Secondly, I'm super excited to be here, kicking off this session. My name's Cameron Poole. Welcome to my talk, Geospatial on a Shoestring, my experience in native title. Now, alternative titles for this talk include My Data Sucks, Your Data Sucks, Everyone's Data Sucks, a Manifesto, uh, Everything is Broken and I Don't Have Time to Fix It Because I've Broken Something Else, and Machines Need to Start Learning Faster Because I've Got No Idea. So, uh, before I begin, I should state everything here is my own view and not WiMAX. I've got a lot of lawyers, so I hope they don't sue me. Uh, lastly, just keeping with cultural tradition, uh, just a quick warning. So, uh, a bit of background and context. WiMAX stands for Yamachi Malba Aboriginal Corporation. So, an example of a native title representative body. And these are organisations appointed under the Native Title Act to assist Indigenous people in all aspects of their native title claims. Now, WiMAC as an organisation has got a number of unique considerations. They represent many claims and determinations within the state of Western Australia. During my time, they had approximately 100 staff over three locations, with a staff mixture mostly made up of archaeologists, anthropologists, lawyers and administrative staff. Uh, they deal with a lot of culturally and legally sensitive information. They've got a limited budget, outsourced technological expertise, and prior to around 2012, they had minimal spatial or data standardisation practices since their conception. Of course, no geospatial talk would be complete without a map. So here are the claims and determinations represented by WiMAC. Uh, the Yamachi region is uh, in the south around Geraldton, and the Marble region up in the north, kind of around Karatha and Tom Price area. So, okay, this is my first time presenting, maybe my last time presenting. Uh, I'm not dying or anything, just, you know, if this goes bad, they'll move countries and go into hiding. I mean, I might still anyway, but, you know, it's just bombs. Uh, I've been a part of the Phosphor G community for a few years now. Um, it's given me a lot, mostly in terms of income, but a lot of fun and knowledge along the way. So I thought it was about time I bloody gave something back. At the heart of this presentation is the story of the map men. There's a story of friendship, technical issues, data that makes me cry, cultural issues, and mapping. It's a story of an organisation going from almost no spatial infrastructure to having a functioning, efficient, and effective spatial department on a budget. And we call the spatial department the map men. And the spelling's intentional, by the way. So in the beginning, there was the map father, and he bringeth the map men. Map man himself has over 25 years of GIS experience in many organisations, government agencies and departments. I started with almost none. Uh, prior to Mapman, there was no spatial department at WiMAC. He built it from the ground up. Quickly, a bit about me, the map boy. Uh, I graduated uh, with a Bachelor of Health Science in 2010. I immediately began working at the Department of Health in WA in the data linkage branch. And I started to learn to program there because I soon realised that one day I could maybe automate myself entirely out of a job and get paid to do so. So I went to back to uni, I spent a few years working towards getting a master's when I was approached by Mapman, not on a dark street or anything, just, you know. Uh, and he, offered to, he asked me to come work at WiMAC. Um, during my time at WiMAC, there were other map men and map people, but this is where my story begins. So when I started at WiMAC, I was given these central tenets of being a map man. And I included these because they guided a lot of the decisions we made in the spatial department during my time at WiMAC. I also included these because they might be the only sage advice you'll get during this whole talk. So, uh, number one, spatial is not special. Two, it's not my GIS, it's our GIS. Three, never worry about making mistakes, worry about not learning from them. Admit to your mistakes quickly, they're then far easier to fix. Four, don't withhold your GIS expertise, share it, it's of no benefit to you. Never assume what others know, they may well know more than you think. Five, don't teach GIS to other people, encourage them to learn. Six, good maps aren't made in a GIS. They come from telling the story they're required to very well. Seven, GIS expertise is only useful if it recognises what it doesn't know. Resorting to blinding people with GIS science means you haven't understood the problem yourself. Nine, technology doesn't get you out of a hole. Ask more questions, never just buy more technology. And ten, don't use the words GIS outside of these commandments. Information is description enough. I'm going to break that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so we had one goal in the spatial department, and that was to make information easy, accessible, and accurate. 
I myself had one goal that was just to automate myself out of a job. And uh, I didn't automate everything, but I no longer have a job at YMAX, so that's like <laughs> kind of a pass, right? <laughs> uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of chaos disorder, a lot of Excel spreadsheets, GPX files, shape files, and long wait times for maps. There was no real organisational standard, uh, standardisation in terms of spatial infrastructure, and the native title tribunal was handling the mapping jobs. So, Mapman starts working in September of 2012, finds the required core data sets, purchases software and map printers, then starts mapping like crazy. Commencing a torrent of requests, everything from site maps, technological descriptions for core, to maps and data for going out on surveys. Now, Mapman brought along order and some really neat software, and now a lot of our architecture was open source, but we still relied on some proprietary software, and occasionally some free proprietary software, which I know sounds like a bit of a misnomer, but for those not-for-profits out there, here's the thing. If you do good things, in general, people will want to help you do those good things. And in some cases, that means free software. So I just want to acknowledge those companies that helped us out. Now, Mapman was swamped by requests. He was able to smooth talk management into hiring part-time help, and the first of the geospatial specialists was hired. Now, this person really knew what they were doing. They still do, but they used to as well. Um, they set up some batch scripting with FME for our automated downloads, built a tool in Google Earth, and started working on some demo PostGIS and GeoServer instances. However, one and a half people wasn't enough to fulfill all the requests, so they began training staff in using QGIS to produce their own maps. Now, I'll go into a bit more detail about this, but it was a big step forward for the spatial department for easing stress. So, then the geospatial specialist left, and the reign of Matt Boy begins. <laughs> now, it's fair to say we had data everywhere and in every format. So what I wanted to do was centralise all our data in one place to make it searchable and easy to work with. So I combined the powers of PostGIS and GeoDjango and built us a spatial web portal for all of our spatial needs. And now the portal housed our data, but it also allowed us to build things like web pages for requests, useful links, downloads, and other useful information. So I carried on the work of automating our data downloads and other repetitive processes, moving from batch scripts to FME Workbench and Server. And just a side note here, I could have written everything in Python, which was my initial inclination. However, not only is FME easy for programmers, it was also good for non-programmers. So where, where I could, I tried to look for solutions that would work without a de developer to keep them going. Originally, we used a lot of instructional Word documents and PDFs, and although easy to edit, Finding information was tough, so I built us a spatial wiki using DocuWiki. The wiki included step-by-step -step instructions for common procedures and other information relevant to the spatial team. Now, there are a lot of good reasons for a wiki, but the main ones were to ensure the longevity of the system and to mitigate against team member loss. Now, I did some other good things. Highlight include making our geo server instance more operational, helping train more staff in the art of QGIS, helping set up a ranger program, collecting data using fulcrum, things like invasive animal and track management, wildlife surveys, tracking bilby barrows, and I helped set up a return of cultural materials site. So YMAC had a lot of complex mapping requests which required good data, a solid understanding of cartographic principles, and particularly when it came to presenting evidence to courts and lawyers. We also had a lot of simple mapping requests that just took a long time to fill user demands. So we realised we had the resources of experienced technical people, they just needed harnessing. Anyone can make maps if you make it easy enough. So what I really want to focus on now is how do you get non-spatial people to start using spatial software well. So I think you can teach anyone to make a map in less than an hour, but can they do it two days later? What about two weeks later? So how do we get ARCs, Antros and lawyers to use QGIS infrequently and well? The answer, of course, is to make things as simple as possible. If you don't, you'll lose people, and then you'll be back to be mapping all by yourself. So the way we did this is to reduce cognitive load. By having everything in one place, we used a plugin called YMAC Tools, which is just a customised and modified version of DC tools, and DC are now called DPOR, it's enough acronyms, but a massive thanks to them for providing the source for it. Um, I think it's just an example. If you ask people for help, they'll provide it. So some of these features include uh, a browser with just our core data sets, and this pointed to our spatial drives and posters server. A uh, menu with useful links and menu items for loading certain actions onto layers. A uh, zoom to point tool, allowing for different coordinate systems or to a locality in our core data sets. And I think the real genius was a map composer which uses our built-in templates and makes it easy to customise and produce reasonably good cartographic maps. 
Now, here's an example of the map made with the composer. It's not winning any awards, but it's good enough for a lot of the uses. So we also did some other neat things with QGIS to make life easier. Custom actions, always awesome. Uh, integrated YMAC tools with our PostGIS server, allowing us to use triggers, history, restrict access, custom views for groups, customized attribute forms, the validation and easier input, and a tool for loading imagery layers. Now, I know none of this is revolutionary and a lot you can do with alternative plugins or standard QGIS free. However, I think by simplifying things, you can keep your users coming back and actually making maps. And even with all of this, however, it still took an immense amount of training and support. So you don't always need to make a map, but you just might have a question that you want answering quickly. Like the rest of the world, YMAC could be divided into two groups. Those who will willingly learn QGIS, uh, let's call this first group the archaeologists and anthropologists, and those <laughs> who will, if forced to, let's call this second group lawyers. <laughs> so for those who the QGIS training didn't stick, we had YMAC Earth. In short, there was just a set of KML files of all of our core data sets, and this was created around 2013 during the <coughs> time when Google Earth Pro still cost money, and we got it free thanks to Mattman and Google's outreach program. So just remember to ask for help. Here's an example of it, and you can see our core data sets. They're updated weekly, easily searchable, and people are familiar with Google products, so it requires less training and support. So I apologize if you thought I was gonna deliver a prescriptive roadmap to running a spatial department on a budget, Hopefully you got some ideas of what we did. Now I'm going to tell you where everything fell down and maybe your solutions will be better than mine. So uh, standardizing data takes a lot of time and effort. Do it as soon as possible. The same goes for da data validation. We did not do that. Uh, I'm doubtful the machines are going to take over for a while because automation in practice is easy. In reality, it's kind of hard. And especially when you're dependent upon external data, there's a high chance that eventually things will break down. Now, I love new feet. A software features as a developer. Um, however, updates do fix a lot of bugs, but when you've got custom code like YMAC tools, they also introduce a lot of bugs. And I know developers try to keep backwards compatibility, but it's hard to fully comprehend how new changes will affect old code. And this goes for FOSS and proprietary software we use, so just be careful. Uh, I love challenges, but sometimes you can't fix everything. I certainly said yes too much just for the challenge. <laughs> I think FOSS can take up a fair amount of time resources because you are the support. You have to fix things and maybe sometimes there's a time money trade-off often not considered about that. Spatial software, generally speaking, needs a fair amount of memory. So does everything else now. Is it easier to just buy more RAMs and spend more time writing more efficient code? And the biggest thing I learned is that money may be limited, but so is your time. Work begets more work. And can all of this be supported without a a developer, uh, I suspect what a lot of what was built may fall by the wayside when things break sufficiently enough. So in summation, to generate change and support geospatial on a shoestring, here's what I think you need to do. You need whole wide organization support. You need to make it as easy as possible. You need to invest a lot of resources, and by this I mean time more than money, and you need to support it. If you don't support it, then you're back to making maps by yourself. And you need to adapt to fit the skill sets of your users, if you need help, just ask. And finally, and most importantly, you need someone to drive it. You need a champion. So, which brings me to my motivation for giving this talk. And I hope it's been a little enlightening. Um, I give it a little, a little reluctantly. Unfortunately, Matt Mann is not here to give this talk, so I'm giving it in his stead. I'm sure he would have done a better job of it than me. But I wanted to give something back to the community. And I also just wanted to express my gratitude for the community. All those from developing the software, to those writing documentation, to the teachers, to the users and the donors. But I really wanted to thank those champions pushing open source software in organizations. On top of this, I really wanted to honor Matt Mann. He was the one who pushed it all at WiMAC. He did a fantastic job, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity I got to work with him and the passionate people at WiMAC, whom I consider to be a second family. Now, Matt Mann was a great colleague, a great friend, a champion of FOZ, and he was a great father. Matt Mann is, was, in fact, my father, Clive. <laughs> now, now, my father passed away one month shy of his 61st birthday, and two months before we were, first, before we were both to attend our first FOSS 4G conference together in Seoul. And I'd like to think that he could have come, become a very involved member of the open source community. Alas, it was not meant to be. We lost an advocate and a champion. In his wake, though, I believe there are people who can fill the void the great man left. 
So I wanted to give this talk to honour him and in the spirit of openness and community. Unfortunately in life, we don't often get the chance to fully acknowledge other people's hard work. So I wanted to thank those champions out there pushing FOSS and working on it. And I'd like to acknowledge the organisers of this event, and in particular, John Bryant, who was a very switched on geospatial specialist I mentioned earlier, and my good friend. He's helped me a lot personally, so big thanks, John. Uh, I also want to encourage others to give back to the community and advocate the open source way within their organisations. And lastly, I'd like to advocate for enjoying yourselves and each other whilst we're still here to do it. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for listening to me. I'm slightly over time, but I'm going to forgo a few qu seconds of questions to let Matt Man play me out. Two questions. Anybody want to ask a question? Easy. Yeah. We have a question here. Uh, the Aboriginal culture here, are there any real perceived hassles of trying to get from one site into the, a geospatial system? Um, yeah, th th there, are, there are a few hassles. I mean, of, of course, you've got the cultural problems around sacred sites, so um, you can only really keep a boundary of where they are. Um, you've got gender differences, so only men can see some sites. Um, uh, yeah, they're the, they're the big two, really, sacred sites and gender issues. And also, within WIMAC, there was a lot of issues because uh, you've, got legal, you've got lawyers working on different claims that might be, uh, well, in disagreement with each other, so you've got to separate uh, a lot of stuff from the lawyers. Yeah. One more question, anybody? Oh, I have a question about, so there was a boundary data, the sacred site data, what other data sets were you bringing together to help um, substantiate the claims? Uh, so, well, it's mostly site data, um, but then also a lot of anthropological stories have to be transferred <laughs> to maps, which is kind of hard. Um, yeah, that's, I think they're the, that's the main one that's pretty hard. Thanks. Thanks, anyway. Cameron. That's uh, great. Cool.